Thanks for sound. A uh, good presentation. Austin Haskell meetup, June 19th. Got some feedback that uh, some people would like to have me give the presentation. I'm going to do it as a screencast. I don't find it as much value in recording me in front of a monitor or something. Um, presentation code can't go wrong. The meetup was originally titled along the lines of new type, which is a pretty nice feature in Haskell that you don't see in a lot of other languages, even other typed functional brain languages. It's not exclusively about new type, though. I really mostly wanted to talk about how to write type safe code in general in Haskell and how to reason about the, the inhabitants of types, domain, codomain, data, codata, that whole deal. First thing I want to cover is that Prelude is um, it's pretty dangerous uh, relative to you know, the typical code you might get in most Haskell libraries, which sounds crazy because Prelude is kind of the foundation of uh, how everybody begins with Haskell and it's the base set of functions that are just kind of implicitly there unless you turn on the main implicit code extension. And the thing is, is that if you know what you're doing, it's not that big of a deal. But I know a lot of people that bump into these problems. A lot of it is because of uh, one of a couple of things. Either because in the case of length, you're passing codata to a function that expects data. So to demonstrate, that's data. And it's data because we can comprehend the entire data, the, the entire list. It's, uh, process every single one inside of it and we can use an algebra, an inductive algebra to build it up. But it's not data not properly. It's an infinite list, it goes from one in down into infinity and it's, uh, it's code data, which is, in the case of list, a, a co-inductive list is really more of a stream. And code data is defined in terms of co-inductive operations, which don't build up and then terminate, which with my data, the data example above, that goes from 1 through 10, that you can finish building that list. In fact, that process terminates. But with my code data, the process never terminates. And always get more out of it. So with data, we talk about the algebra, the inductive algebra of constructing instances of data, terminating it actually. That's what we're concerned with because we stated we prefer things and we prefer things to terminate. But with codata, we're less concerned with termination and more concerned with productivity. Productivity simply means that if I apply one of the co-inductive, co-algebraic operations to it, I can destruct something out of it. And the act of destructing something out of our, my code data example would be as simple as just take one. Um, which is fine. That's fine. And, and this works fine with an infinite list because we're not actually trying to process the whole list. It works just fine with, with my data as well. There's nothing, nothing special or different about that. But the problem is, is that if you write functions that have to process the entire list to get an answer, having the data and codata use case in the same type can confuse some new people who don't have a check for that. So we have like n votes with zero, my data with 10, as we expect. But if we do it on the codata, it's never going to turn. So it, and it's not going to turn, it's just going to keep trying to process more thunks to produce more values out of the stream, but it never stops producing values. Whereas when we hit the number 10 on my data, trying to process the next value just gets you 
and then we got the rest of them all killed, so I'm not trying to get to the list. So, life is a little bit dangerous. Um, head is a little bit dangerous too. Um, it's also a little bit silly, because you shouldn't really use it. Especially if you're new to half skull. It, um, it's unnecessary, given pattern matching, because you can just pattern match using cons operator, like that, and that's the same as giving head. So, head's fine even with an infinite list, because it's the same as take one. Or sorry, it's not the same as take one. Ooh. Yeah, not the same thing. Fuck myself there. Take always returns a list. Head always returns the first single item. Okay. So the problem with head though is that it throws an exception if you pass it an empty list. And unless you're using non empty from uh, the semi groups library, a regular list will always have the possibility, the uncertainty included that you could get an empty list. So you need to write functions that have some way of intelligent handling an empty list, or if they're supposed to return a list anyway, you should probably just kick the empty list back out, much like how uh, math does. But there's alternatives. There's a safe prelude that has a head maybe. Instead, when you add an empty list, you get nothing. Which is what they do. And then there's you know tail. Um, there's also fold out one, fold out whatever time. Um, so an example here is. So that's fine. I just it's the same as calling sum for all intents and purposes. Right? But I can't sum an infinite list. Because to get a total sum, I have to stop somewhere. But if I instead choose to process a subset of the infinite list, I'm fine because I'm guaranteed to get a, a limited data subset of the code data that it's take. So that's fine. And hold all prime, hold all one are all subject to the same limitation that they can't be used on an infinite list. Uh, from just is dangerous, so from from just is uh, it's from data dot maybe and its type is a little problematic. You, if, if you've been has using Haskell for a little while, you should be able to read the type and see that there's something a little suspicious about this. There's not really a good or principled way to go from maybe a directly to a. There there is a function that lets you provide a default value to fall back on in case you have nothing. And for any of you that are that are new, maybe is just nothing or just if. So you can have nothing or just an if, just a string, so on and so forth. And if I call this on instance of just, that's fine, but exception, just like head, if nothing. But, it's also from maybe, and if you give it a default value, oops, there we go, if you give it a default value, or you have a way to provide a default value, then that works as well. But if you don't have a sensible default value, if you don't you know, have some kind of substitute value, in the nothing case, then you should probably just leave maybe alone and learn how to lift from map functions over types like maybe and what would that look like? Well, a simple example would just be f map from functor. Just lift the increment function over maybe. Why does that work? Because increment is a functor. 
Okay, so it doesn't break functions like that. No problem, so I should see how it happens. Why do we know that? Just from the type. Just from the type. You can tell that we have a function A, B. We start with a functor A, and we end with a functor B. And if you just kind of look at it structurally, it makes sense that a function that goes from A to B, and we're able to go from F A to F B, that means that the A to B got applied to the other one we got to B. And so, yeah. And because of parametric polymorphism, we know that we can't do anything with f that doesn't come from the functor type class. So all we're allowed to do is just apply the function according to how the f map instance is implemented by the functor or something like that thing. And uh, it's actually the map function I used earlier really is actually redundant. Functor f map does the same thing as map. It's identical. It's just that map is monomorphic, whereas f map is polymorphic and applicable to more than just a list. So from just is a bad idea, and you probably don't need to squish the uh, the maiden type and make it go away. Similarly, you probably don't need to use unsafe formula or any generation or something like that. Maximum minimum in here as well, because how can you get a maximum? Unless you process the whole list, and you can't process the entire list. So, some dice reverse, same deal. There's probably other functions that are moderately dangerous, but this is a good place to start thinking about when I'm using functions in code. Should I be thinking about am I assisting with any possible list? Am I only expecting the rough? Am I expecting the code data? Most of the less than these functions can really concern us. There are others as we come just in the but there's a couple others too. Such as read, actually. Read is an exception. Um, it doesn't have to, you can use reads correct instead, but by default, you just use read. A tell to spec the mint and the strings, you know, mod and mint, then you get an exception. Or um, I think there's a read main or a read main or something like that. But regardless, it, it returns media instead of going directly from string to A, it goes to media. And in the nothing cases, I couldn't parse the thing, which is an excellent exception. There's no real reason to handle exceptions for errors that you can anticipate. In my opinion. So when we're talking about functions that can't handle all of the values that their types imply, then we're talking about partial functions and that's what's dangerous. And how do we know? Well, list of A here, uh, that includes the possibility of actually doesn't go. Head doesn't handle it. There's an exception. That makes it a partial function. So you should prefer total functions that can handle every single value the type allows. By default, again, if you want to pass the user, this doesn't apply to quite so much, but for this reason, it makes sense when you task for user experiences that don't like code to defer to, or at least not as likely. Another advantage of using total functions is your encodes intent more precisely. For example, if you have a function that really cannot handle an empty list, then don't use list. Use non empty. It's a non empty list. That encodes your intent more precisely. Besides, just for what I was talking about, you can't make it not code in an empty list. You just can't get it because you can't process the entire thing. And, and to touch on precision, most programming languages, especially dim lanes, they, they only give you positive space, the ability to create structure, but they don't give you the ability to eliminate possibilities or to be more precise about what component of the structure you created is 
is valid. And this isn't good, even though any of you that might be watching this that come from a design or that background will know exactly what I'm talking about in the native space. And I gave this talk, I think it was uh, Carmel that mentioned it, and we took drawing classes, one of the exercises is that you were supposed to draw a picture of a figure and just by only filling in the negative space, not by drawing in the features of the actual the positive outside parts. And this is a general thought process you want to engage with as a Haskell user. Part of the benefit of learning Haskell is learning how to use both positive and negative space to create code and APIs and documentation and types in general that communicate more precisely and clearly to consumers who use the APIs what exactly is the, the code supposed to do. Without that, you, you're not looking for everything possible. If you don't need the co-inductive use case of list, then consider using the vector or sequence unless you really need compatibility without the cost of a fun list with this. If you don't need that compatibility, then use the vector or sequence. If you know for a fact that in order to do whatever work it is you're doing, that you'll have to process the entire collection in order to avoid the process to return an answer, then you decidedly do not have something compatible with co-inductive data, and you should probably use vector or sequence. Again, there are exceptions. Sometimes the list is fine just for performance reasons. They're terribly common. Usually the list isn't the fastest thing in the world for any given list, but it happens. Um, I've seen linked lists of vectors we use for things like that sometimes, and, for example, a buffer. That uh, you have to allocate in chunks and things like that. Um, but in general, if you know for a fact that it's an inductive use case where you're processing the entire thing, strongly consider vector sequence. And uh, don't lose head with this. Those are really good too. Just bad matching. Domain encoder name. Decoder name. The main is, let's just take an example here. So there's an op function. It takes a bool, returns a bool. What is fun? So when we talk about the domain of not, we're talking about the set of all values that the arguments can take. And then we're talking about the set of all values that the value returns. I'm using bool as an example here because it's easy to reason about. There's only two inhabitants in bool. It's got two null array constructors, one called false, one called true. Type here, we need a Haskell, means it's a sum type. And when we're reasoning about the inhabitants of a type, when you have a sum type, you just add the inhabitants together. So, and a nullary constructor is just, it stands for itself. It's a standalone value. It exists as a single inhabitant of the type. So, false is one, true is one. And that's plus, so it's one plus one plus two. So the reason you bool is that you only have two inhabitants to think about. So our domain for not is two values, two inhabitants of the type three. So that's all there is. And Returns bool. So that is the code name. And that has two inhabitants as well. And we don't have to know how the function is implemented. We know it's just one type. So domain of two, code name of two. The problem is that types like string or for that matter, text or byte string, they're they're a bit much. More often than not, we are writing code that is problem specific. And you didn't have in mind to handle every possible screen in the universe when you wrote that code. As a result, 
string shouldn't be a type integer. Why? Because type string has in its domain every possible string. All of them. So if that's not your intent, then you're being imprecise in your API. And that's not what you want. And since string by default is this car, again, suboptimal type, usually for production code, you have text, but text has the same property of being roughly arbitrarily large, arbitrarily large. So when you have string or text, you're not being very precise, unless you're just writing generic like utility functions something for processing strings or text, or maybe you're writing natural language processing library or something like that. In that case, you, you do more or less intend to process any possible string or text value. If that's the case, then that's fine, but that's not the case. Usually something specific, like host, server, anything like that. If that's the case, use a new type. That's what we're talking about. Int is a little crazy too. And I've seen C programmers in particular use ints and they really want to some type, usually with no other constructors. I double checked, I, I may be off by one on this, but I think this is the domain of int. And anything that accepts an int having this domain of value, it's just a single int value, that's how many values possible. So down 64 machine. So the end on 64 machine just means 64. That's a lot of values to be using all. Your code probably isn't handling it. It's probably also not handling all the code properly. So yeah, again, unless you really mean an arbitrary int, which can happen. Which can happen. But unless you really mean an arbitrary int, you should strongly consider new type of something so here's an example data web server equals web server string okay so web server has a string but string not very precise we don't know what that means what string is supposed to be that doesn't tell us but we can be more precise we can add a new type of host New types are limited to the constraint that they can only be a null array, or sorry, a null array, one constructor. What's nice about new types is there's no runtime overhead. The, the difference between the new type and the underlying representation of the type, of string in this case, gets erased in Python. There's no overhead using a new type. There is for data, though. It will it'll end up wrapping it into the structure. Hold on, put a little bit of structure in there and run it anyway. Do the contain anyway, even if it's only one thing. So, by using this new type host, and now we have a host string, and then we have a web server host. So now we know what web server is. Web server host. It's an improvement, but you can still do things that don't make sense. So the next tactic is elaboration on this is we don't export the host constructor so that people can't do that. After we hide the host constructor, our users still need a way to construct a host object, right? Because that's what web server expects. And if we hide a constructor, we hide the constructor. The answer is we make a we make a construct a function. That constructs a host, but it returns maybe host, not just host. And this is useful because it means we can validate the string to make certain that's not ridiculous. Or we send it to that code. And just assume that we bother to write some more validation code for the URLs. But web server expects host, not maybe host. Okay, if since web server only has one thing in it, just immediately, immediately just use f
Okay. So if I try to that is important. It expects host, not the host. Simple enough. We can app map lift the web server constructor. It's just a function. Right? It's host a web server. Okay. Type of map. Okay. So in this case, the app is maybe. derive um, the show type class so we need a string clock and see the data. And uh, I couldn't do that until I derived it for host words because web server contains host and the way deriving is is it just recursively puts a lot of types inside the type and show just starts accumulating the string by using all the different type class instances the type is composed to it. So what we've done is we went from a host to a web server, but we lifted the web server constructor into maybe. And with it lifted, the uncertainty of possibly not having a host gets turned into the uncertainty of possibly with the web server. And you can generalize this over So give this a hand type. And we add a port type just so we have a second argument in our web server constructor. And then if we've got a server, a web server constructor, this uh, bracket dollar sign, bracket catch, it's it's just F map. It would be the same as if I did that. You're commonly applicable for, but these other useful things that you can see on the side. That's correct. The cache is the thing, or sorry, my grid is flat. It's a confusing interpreter. Okay, we have a web server. So to explain.
it's the same deal as Functor. We have to be uncertain to the uh, individual component to the page. And then we move that uncertainty and, and shift it to the entire constructor. And what happens if one of them is nothing instead of just the thing you expect? So what this does is it saves us the trouble of having actually remaining in handle intermediate uncertainties because oftentimes your types will happen and you just move the field. fields you could even have records in the five, ten fields, certain kinds of stuff depending on what you're trying to make specific problems you need to solve it. And some portion or subset of them may actually be you may only be able to get maybe for those types because you're validating the input data that generates the data. As a result, you don't really want to, if, if, if the result is going to be the same, if you're just going to kick out a nothing value, if any one of those things doesn't exist, then you might as well just use a point that there's no reason to do that. And sometimes the code can fail in the end of the day. And that's why we run type boxes like this, so that we can do the right thing, not lie about the uncertainty of bad data, but not write a lot of things to handle very good systems. Two types of important for a few different things. One is it, it drops all the baggage associated with the type. What do I mean by that? Well, the nothing in the code knows that our host is actually a string. We, we can't pass around our host as if it was a string. We can if we have a, access to a constructor. We do have the ability to pattern match on the constructor and get it a string. But the host is not a string, even though it's reusing the representation of a string, which is very useful. And again, there's no one time over there. The difference gets a risk to compile time after time checking. So it's free. There's no reason not to use it. It's called its value. Is called it boxing, unboxing, super reliable, and pretty difficult to use it about. And in fact, I'd argue you can't. But if you type, you know exactly what it's going to do. And if you need to reuse existing type classes, you can just re-derive any of the base of type classes that support derivation. Or you can turn on generalized to type deriving, and then even the custom type classes will be derived. And if you don't export the value constructor for the new type, which what I'm talking about here is for new type port. So is equal sign. Left hand side is the type constructor. Right hand side is the data constructor or value constructor. And if we don't export that, then users can't just directly create an integer that hasn't been validated and you can get mass arrays in an inhabited port. It's really useful. It, as I said, you drop all the baggage between the type class instances, but also, as I said, you, you can redirect them. It's not a big deal. Um, if you want to change the way type class behaves for a particular type, just create a new type out of that type. Rederive everything but the one type class instance you want to change. Implement that one type class, and you're good. No broken code, no incoherent or orphan type class instances. It's the way you want to do it. There's other sources of danger. So, to demonstrate, the problem here is that we've created this type block. It's a subtype. And one of the inhabitants is a normal reconstruction called B. And another is, is, is alt, which 
function is now in the way constructed actually is a single field directory. Kind of like the product by the alpha system access. The problem is you're using record syntax inside the sum type. And if we have an alt, okay, so I'm sorry. And if I call the access function, the record accessor on that value, that gets out. But what if I call them new? It turns into a basic exception. So there's a couple ways to handle this. The most immediate and direct way, especially if it's a trivial type like this, is to not create the record access at all. Instead, now there's no record access or to break. In order for you to pattern match on this, you would or could be pattern matching or should be pattern matching in the case as well. So you don't worry about the function. You know, so you're just done. But we have another option. Let's just split the record type up. So we create a new type. Again, that could be new today. And again, because it's a new type, no additional overhead. Now, we still use record syntax, we still have the access to the type is different. It's not blah. It's all proxy and I try to use access on that so it's typo. I try to use access on E, and it's supposed to typo because the law is not all proxy and that's what our type expects. It doesn't have to be any type. I mean, if you have more than one field, it can't be any type. But it's still a reasonable option. You don't need your problems at all. Not for the products like that. You're going to want record syntax for it. Parting thoughts are that you could think about how, like with our alpha proxy example, how splitting out sub, not subtypes, but more granular types of the sub type. They allow you to circumscribe value cabinets of types. So you could have a function that goes from blah to proxy, you probably couldn't safely have a function that goes directly from blah to proxy because there's that uncertainty, again, partial total functions of there being a weak value. But you probably have a function that's made by proxy. Why can't you have that? Because we bought it to split up on some type. That's what I'm talking about here. And it can allow you to be more precise about which inhabitants and types you're talking about. That's the point. So we don't have to worry about accidental partial functions if you can write functions to try to control a subset of key values that it's being talks about. And that's it. If you have any questions about the uh, types of the inductive, co-inductive types, algebras or algebras, it's been on math or type theory at all. If there are any questions about the that won't blow up in your face. I'm Bite My Hat on Twitter and GitHub.